Good morning and welcome, and apologies for the delayed start owing to a slight technical difficulty. My name is Elliot Refson and I lead the funds sector at Jersey Finance. Alongside working with industry and government regarding regulation, legislation and innovation, our role is to provide clarity on the vital role Jersey plays in international finance. In this session, our expert panel will focus on private equity and distribution. The AUM of funds in Jersey has seen growth of 65% over the past five years and just over 100% over the past 10 years. According to the latest Monterey report, the private equity venture capital space represents 56% of all AUM of funds in Jersey, a figure which has grown 144% over the past five years. And this is not just a few large funds. In terms of the number of funds, there's been growth of 71%, and one in three funds in Jersey is either um, private equity or venture capital. To look at the reasons for this growth, I'm pleased to introduce Ben Robbins, who is a partner of the law firm Marant Ozan, a former chairman of our industry body, the Jersey Funds Association, and one of Jersey's leading funds lawyers. Ben is also a member of the BVCA Channel Island Committee. Ben advises on the formation, operation and financing of private equity, venture capital and debt funds and investment structures as well as real estate. Ben regularly advises fund promoters, managers, investors, directors and service providers across a wide variety of asset classes. Ben. Thanks very much, Elliot, for that introduction, um, which so clearly evidenced the significant growth in the use of Jersey structures for private equity and venture capital investment in recent years. For over 30 years, ever since the establishment of the first UK and European mega GPs in the early 1990s, Jersey's PE hosting industry has grown and developed as a true market leader. And today it is one of the most sophisticated global PE jurisdictions. With European venture capital on course to hit new records despite COVID-19, um, Jersey in 2020 has hosted some of the largest new multi-billion global mega funds, as well as a broad mix of successful mid-market GPs and smaller startup and niche managers. So Jersey is working hard for GPs operating across all these layers of the global PE market. Some of those larger GPs have put down firm roots in Jersey with principals and employees operating from offices established here in the island. And others rely on the hosting services of our thriving fund administration and non-executive director community. And we'll be hearing from seasoned experts from each of these communities on our panel today. Jersey has been continually evolving its understanding and delivery of what GPs and investors really need by embracing and absorbing developments in PE infrastructure and technology over the decades, whether in fund terms, fund administration platforms, investor and GP portals, side letter complexity, fund financing technology, the secondaries market, GP-led restructurings, and co-investment activity. These are all now meat and drink to Jersey's seasoned PE industry, which continues to look ahead at what's coming next, with ESG issues in particular now front of mind, as we'll be discussing in today's panel. But what is it about Jersey's private equity ecosystem that has cemented that success and continued appeal? Well, firstly, the certainty that comes from using a jurisdiction with tried and tested structures that have housed PE funds and parallel co-investment, single asset and holding vehicles from establishment through to liquidation through various market cycles over the decades. In particular, the Jersey Limited Partnership in use since 1994 and its more recent variants, separate and incorporated limited partnerships. But also many Jersey GP companies have been formed under our 1991 Companies Law, a flexible but familiar version of the UK Companies Act. To signal ongoing product innovation here in Jersey, particularly around the structuring of GP management and carry vehicles, Jersey offers limited liability partnerships and will shortly have a Jersey LLC product, which will be particularly familiar and appealing to US GPs and investors, but will also offer cellular optionality. These different vehicles offer a variety of different asset ownership and tax outcomes, whether transparent or opaque, and it's easy and efficient to get funding into and out of these structures too. 
And with the ability to form new companies and partnerships in a single day, it all makes for a compelling offering for GPs structuring private equity transactions that require quick and reliable transaction execution. Secondly, Jersey offers an unrivaled regulatory flexibility with a range of regimes to suit the differing requirements of particular GPs and their investors. Single asset holding structures aren't required to be regulated as funds in Jersey, unlike the EU, Cayman and UK, where additional regulatory costs in areas such as audit, valuation and custody can mount up. This makes Jersey an ideal place to establish cost-effective single asset and co-investment structures. Where a Jersey structure has multiple assets and investors and falls to be regulated as a fund, Jersey offers a wide and flexible spectrum of regulatory environments. From fast track unregulated funds for non-EU investors to lightly regulated Jersey private structures through to more highly regulated Jersey expert funds which can target 50 or more investors. Jersey private funds in particular have proved to be a huge success since their launch in April 2017. Available for funds with no more than 50 investors, these funds were authorised within 48 hours by the Commission in Jersey in reliance on an application made by the fund's Jersey administrator. And in most cases, the fund's GP will enjoy an exemption from our financial services regulation. Well over 350 private funds have now been launched, accounting for AUM well in excess of 40 billion sterling, and they've allowed new and established managers to launch new funds in a highly cost-effective and time-efficient manner. And in a world of more widely offered funds, targeting more than 50 investors, Jersey's tried and tested expert fund regime continues to thrive, with regulatory licenses issued in weeks rather than months, and even more swiftly for returning GPs launching repeat expert funds. And only where Jersey funds are actively marketed to EU investors does Jersey apply its overlay of relevant AIFMD requirements, which for larger managers are limited to the directives, reporting and disclosure provisions. On this basis, Jersey GPs have successfully marketed throughout the EU under national private placement regimes since the Im implementation of AFMD. This varied regulatory toolkit provides unrivaled optionality and swift, cost-effective execution routes for GPs of different types and sizes depending on the number, location and type of investors they wish to target. The third factor I wanted to outline Jersey structures offer a tax neutrality that's more simply derived than onshore structures, without reliance on complicated double tax treaty arrangements and exemptions and hybrid instruments. Tax transparency and efficiency is vitally important for most PE investors, and particularly for tax-exempt investors such as pension funds. In Jersey, no income tax or capital gains tax is payable by a Jersey PE fund or its general partner. There's no withholding tax on distributions to non-Jersey investors. There's no stamp duty on the transfer of shares or partnership interests. And unlike onshore domiciles, there's no VAT. And when it comes to the taxation of Jersey resident fund GPs or management companies, they're liable to Jersey income tax at a zero rate. Where those companies do manage a fund, those companies must comply with the OECD's new economic substance requirements, but so long as they continue to meet the Jersey management and control norms which have long been in play, with Jersey corporate board meetings and strategic decision making, seasoned by onshore advisory recommendations, compliance is straightforward, with highly experienced Jersey directors and administrators on hand to provide the required local management expertise and support with the related tax reporting. Fourthly, there is a deep and genuine experience and strength in depth in Jersey's PE management and administration industry. And you'll get a very good flavour of that uh, when you hear from our panellists, Michelle, Jed, Mike and Peter a little later. Jersey already hosts over 120 asset management offices with a substantive presence in the island, as well as offering risk and portfolio management expertise and comprehensive administrative services to those managers requiring operational support on the ground. Jersey is home to more than 14,000 finance industry employees including directors, administrators, auditors, bankers, depositories and lawyers, who've been servicing private equity structures for decades through both buoyant and challenging markets, including the global financial crisis. And as the industry looks to navigate the choppy waters flowing from COVID-19, that seasoned experience is proving invaluable. And that human ecosystem is backed up by comprehensive and robust technology infrastructure. Jersey offers ISO compliant technology solutions, including island-wide broadband internet access, which is amongst the fastest in the world. There are large local data centers and comprehensive disaster recovery options. And Jersey's administrators operate across the market's leading fund administration IT platforms. Jersey's fifth advantage is its willingness and ability to cooperate with global authorities in adopting developing international standards. This is an essential feature for a sustainable finance centre in the modern age, as it ensures continued access to global markets and investors. 
Jersey's policy has been to lead from the front in meeting global standards in these areas, resulting in white listings across the board. Jersey has a world leading anti money laundering assessment score. It was a first wave FATCA and CRS signatory and has a broad network of tax information exchange agreements. Jersey has committed to reflect the EU's fifth anti money laundering directive in respect of the creation of public registers by 2023. Jersey was whitelisted by the EU and OECD as a cooperative jurisdiction on tax competition following the introduction of its economic substance regime, and the island remains actively engaged with the OECD on global initiatives, including BEPS. And Jersey is one of only a handful of third countries to have received ESMA approval for future AFMD passporting. The swift adoption of international standards is testament to Jersey's ability to innovate and absorb change, the final key advantage I wanted to highlight this morning. It's not just in reacting to international developments that Jersey thrives, though. Following the successful Im implementation of the Jersey private fund regime, Jersey LLCs will add yet another product to the Jersey structuring toolkit, and legislation was also recently passed to facilitate the migration into Jersey of foreign limited partnerships who might not find themselves with such strong whitelisted credentials. Jersey's highly effective reaction to managing the COVID-19 pandemic and ensuring business as usual has also underscored its reputation as an adaptive jurisdiction something we'll look at in our panel today. So in conclusion, Jersey offers a proven, stable, cost-effective, innovative, and service-driven PE hosting environment for global GPs and their investors. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Mike Johnson, um, who is going to moderate our expert panel today. Thank you. Ben. Thank you. That really sets uh, the scene very well for today's uh, panel discussion. Uh, I think first I should introduce myself. I'm Mike Johnson. I'm Group Head of Institutional Services at Crestbridge, and I'm also Vice Chair of the Jersey Fund Association. I'd like to start by asking my panel to introduce themselves to our audience today as well. Um, Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself first? Thank you. Yes. Hello. I'm, um, I'm Michelle McNanny. I'm from the Aztec Group. Um, I'm co-head of private equity in Jersey, and I also form, form part of the private equity leadership across the East Office that the Aztec Group. Peter? Hi. Yeah, I'm Peter Rioda. I'm an independent non-executive director and consultant specialising in private equity. Um, some of the boards I'm on include Nordic Capital, CVC Capital Partners, um, uh, Marwin Inve uh, Value Investors and uh, Faro Management. Um, my background is um, I started my career in management consultancy and spent the majority of my career um, building a fund administration business which IPO'd in 2016 and after that I became a non-executive director. Um, and I also get involved with the Jersey Funds Association on their, um, on their various committees including the legal and regulatory committee and their education, uh, industry education programme. Thank you, Jed. Morning everyone, my name's Jed Kelly. I head up the um, middle office or head up the fund operations for Nordic Capital based here in Jersey. We're a team, of, a strong team of 15 people um, supporting the active funds of uh, Nordic Capital which are predominantly domiciled in Jersey. Thank you. So I'll just set so some of the administration for today. We're going to go for about 40 minutes of the panel, so apologies for the late start, but our intention is to keep going uh, the extra 15 minutes to 11.15, so do, do try and stay with us. If you've got any questions, ask them as you go along. The team from Jersey Finance will provide them to me on the stage as well. So I think first one to start with Ben's uh, keynote there and his presentation, and want to understand what we're seeing as the key growth um, trends that we're seeing. I think a lot of us are seeing European private equity and VC is on course to hit new records despite COVID-19. So I guess, Michelle, uh, first question to you, is that what we're seeing in Jersey? And if so, what trends are we seeing? Um, I think I can speak for everyone who's been in the industry for some time when I say, you know, successful private equity managers, they are, they are because they're, you know, they're ambitious, they're resilient and they're adaptable. Um, and certainly for us, the overwhelming majority of our clients this year have pushed ahead with their, with their fundraising and their investment plans. Um, so yeah, I think that's very much the trend across the industry. You know, of course, the pandemic has created some changes, but you know, in some sectors, it's opened some opportunities. I suppose for us, uh, remote fundraising has, has very much become the theme of the year. Uh, with many of our clients just effectively getting on with it. Um, you know, they've successfully raised their funds remotely and that's either in line with the expectations they set, you know, before the pandemic or even ahead of, of um, you know, expectations, you know, both in respect of timelines and levels of investor commitments. 
obviously we're lucky to have Jed on the on the panel with us today. Um, you know, they've really had an exceptional year. Uh, we were delighted to work with Jed and the Nordic team um, on their virtual fundraising. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll let Jed cover that in, in, in more detail, but uh, what I would say, it was an incredible achievement. And, um, you know, for me, not only reflects the tenacity and the determination of firms such as Nordic, but also PE industry as a whole. Um, you know, the continued investor appetite, you know, for quality managers with proven investment strategies, you know, it is really positive to see, especially during these unprecedented times. I suppose one area within the fundraising process that we that we've seen an uptick on this year is those um, is the operational due diligence. Um, you know, it's been a steady a steady uptick over the years, to be honest. But I mean, this year there's been a real a real increase, and in both with the you know the number of queries and you know the the the, the, the the level of detail that, that we're required to go to, you know, both the service providers and, and the managers. Also, you know, a, a positive trend, lots of co-investment vehicles being set up, and that's across many of our clients, um, regardless of size or sector. Um, lots of first-time managers we're seeing in Jersey, which is, which is really, really good news. Um, I think some of them are, are, are having some challenges getting the fundraising over the line, but, you know, there are some exceptions um, in, in some of the sectors. Um, so. Overall, for me, it's been a really positive uh, year to see the continued interest in, in Jersey as a, as a funds jurisdiction. And I really see this being down to our political economic stability um, and, of course, our, our expertise in the, uh, you know, as a service provider. Thanks, Michelle. And I guess, Jed, Michelle just touched there. It seems like you fared quite well in the pandemic. Sure. Um, well, maybe just to set the scene a bit, really, we, um, we had our annual investor meeting in April. 2020. So um, it was really at the annual investor meeting where we launched our, our Fund 10. Um, and bearing in mind the annual investor meeting at that time had now converted to a live stream like this one. Everyone was in lockdown and we were going into fundraising. So the timing wasn't, you know, uh, optimal. But um, we had a couple of things in our favor. The, um, the, the, the relationship building that we'd done with the investors um, leading into the lockdown and the pandemic was obviously key. So um, you know that that played out um, and then our portfolio as well I mean just to touch on our kind of investment strategy uh, we we are sector specialists in healthcare uh, technology and financial services and um, you know as a as a COVID resilient uh, nature that the portfolio was holding up well it held up well in Q1 and um, I actually uh, we, we worked with the placement agents read and I asked them you know for some stats and one of the things was that um, on the allocation of where investors are looking to allocate um, you know now the the sort of news is that about 37 percent of investors are looking to carry on with their allocation um, 23 percent are looking to add to healthcare and 18% are looking to add to technology. So we were central to that kind of uh, sector story. So that, that was good. So the third thing that we needed really was that investors did convert to the virtual world that we're now uh, working in. Um, you know, that they did run due diligences virtually and that they were willing to support GPs like ourselves, you know, in this new world who maybe they hadn't met. Um, again, some stats from Reed was because they were monitoring this, and, and you know, um, right back in at the start of uh, I think it was end of March or early April, the the, the level of um, LPs from a survey of 90 um, investors was that about 54% of those investors wouldn't actually support a first-time uh, relationship of a GP. Um, who they hadn't met, so that they, they wouldn't, they would want to do, um, you know, face-to-face -face meetings, and update, and you know, fast forward to now, and that stat is that actually it's only 17 percent. You know, the investors have turned the tide and are now actually considering um, closing funds with with GPs who they actually haven't met. So I think that was key in our success as well was that. You know, investors who they don't want to miss out on allocations, they don't want to miss out on strategies or vintages, or you know, so so they 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 um, converted their processes and their thinking to the virtual way in which we work now, and that that was great. So, so we did we, we closed um, in six months um, at over over six billion, which was over our hard cap. So, or was our hard cap? So, 
yeah, a great, a great story. Um, the kind of investors that we attracted, um, more of the same, I guess. You know, we're, we're heavily, um, we, we source heavily from the US, um, Middle East and, and Asia, and then Europe's about 30%. Um, so, um, so that was where they came from. And then in terms of, you know, the type of investors, I guess it's the majority, nearly, uh, uh, pension funds. Excellent. Thank you, Jared, and congratulations. Um, ben, Michelle touched earlier on the sidecars and the co-invest, the, side, the single asset vehicles that we've seen a lot of recently. You know, wh why Jersey for those? Yeah. Well, I, I think there are two underlying market trends that are driving it. One is opportunism, if effectively. We're in a, we've been in a period where actually valuing assets has been quite difficult, and there's probably a sense that there are some very nicely priced assets out there, which particular GPs want to jump on but can't necessarily align that with a blind pool fundraising. So in joint venture or you know, with, with select investors, capitalizing on those single asset opportunities. And then there are defensive scenarios uh, where you've got an asset which needs, um, you know, within a blind pool fund that just needs a bit of additional funding. And um, you know, sometimes it can be moved out, refunded um, through a, a co-investment or sidecar vehicle. Um, why does Jersey work so well for them? Well, because as I described earlier, single asset structures in Jersey aren't regulated as funds. And uh, they tend to be in the EU, UK, uh, Cayman as a result of changes to its recent private uh, funds legislation. And uh, when they become regulated, that tends to you know, involve audit costs, valuation costs, custody costs. Um, depository costs, which just aren't applicable here in Jersey. Um, very quick authorization process for a non-fund, effectively just establishing your partnership and your related companies and getting on with it. So very swift execution. If you spot the opportunity, come to Jersey, launch your structure. It's not a fund. You know, keep the, keep the costs regulated and also get it done very quickly. Great. And Peter, I mean, at a macro level, are low interest rates and quantitative easing making public markets less attractive? And if so, why does patient capital win in this scenario that, that we're seeing now? And what's Jersey's exposure towards patient capital against uh, the more public markets? Yeah, I think um, low interest rates, QE, has the effect of raising all boats. Um, so all assets have, have increased. But in particular, private equity, um, perhaps because of its high yield, has, um, has won in that and been risen more. Um, now, the the patient capital attractiveness for private equity, I think, and why does private equity have a higher yield um, to other markets? The answer maybe that is um, private equity is able to deploy uh, different strategies and, and um, use different levers to extract value, and in particular, uh, the value, the buyer-built opportunistic strategy where that's most effective. Public markets are still very um, attractive, probably the best place for large, very large cap and uh, high growth, large cap businesses like the banks. Um, but the big markets is, you know, the, the value side of the public markets hasn't fared as well. And I think it's because in the ship, um, it's much harder to deploy effective value strategies. Um, Jersey's benefited from allocation to private equity because of Jersey's long history and exposure to that asset class. So we've, we've benefited by more of that and by the growth in the in the markets um, generally and I think Jersey's um, infrastructure its um, depth and breadth of service provision here um, makes it a natural home for private equity and patient capital. Great and just want to pick up on um, ESG elements a, a little bit um, Ben or Jed um, is it still in is it an integral part of the strategy or is it a niche? And maybe, maybe Jed possibly first, you know, what are you seeing in side letters if you're able to say, is it, is it separate there or is it mainstream? How, how are you seeing it? Sure, actually? sure. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that the Nordics are all being quite at the forefront at the thinking on ESG and it's always been implicit in our decision-making process and what's happened more recently, I suppose it's become explicit. Um, and as a result of that, really, um, it isn't a side story that we hold inside letters. This is mainstream. It's part of our investment mandate. We get due diligence on our ESG process. You know, it's, it's, it's something that stacks up as part of our investment thesis. And is there a difference from Fund 9? Or was it already there in Fund 9? Or are we seeing a trend? I think that's fair. It's a trend, you know, that, that um, investors want to see um, the ESG story more central. And um, in Fund 10, it absolutely was. 
great. And Ben, in your practice, you're seeing trends. Yeah, within that I mean, I, I think there are a few touch points. I mean, I mean, the G, the governance. Um, there is no doubt that uh, investor focus on that, and actually GP focus on what we do as service providers, whether you know administrators, lawyers, etc. Um, you know, e in a jurisdiction like Jersey, has tightened as as it should. Um, real focus on diversity and inclusion issues, which is very healthy and what one would expect. Um, in terms of the, the E and the S, I mean, we, we are, I mean, a bit like Jed, we get asked as a service provider sometimes to, um, you know, complete reports on, on how we meet particular standards. And absolutely, the, people, the GPs that are instructing us are starting to ask us about what we're doing. And so it is a real area of focus. Um, I think in terms of Jersey PLC and what is Jersey doing and what strategies is Jersey looking at and, and adopting in order to sort of reflect this, um, there is a sort of sustainable finance initiative at the moment uh, which industry and government are working on to try and get uh, more funding into the Durrell Wildlife uh, Conservation Trust here in Jersey, have an amazing, um, not just zoo, but um, you know, uh, support to um, world wildlife there, a great way of using Jersey's finance industry to disperse uh, you know, sustainable finance funding out to um, global endangered species, colobus monkeys, speckled bears, wildebeest, whoever it might be, um, throughout the world. Um, in terms of rules and regulations, we've seen that the EU has put in place ESG-focused regulations. Um, and the rest of the world hasn't really caught up yet. You've not really seen it in the US, you've not seen it in Asia. Um, so much, not that it's ignored, but nothing really has coalesced yet. So I think Jersey's approach is to look at what's developing, look at what's happening in Europe, look at what's happening in the rest of the world. And then I mean, there was an FSC consultation recently on the topic which industry has responded to. And I think my sense, certainly um, speaking to people around the JFA committee table, is that probably the right direction to go, go in is not necessarily to apply ESG rules and regulations and principles to any and all funds, but to focus on those that really do have um, uh, uh, an E and an S element to their investor objective, uh, to their investment objectives, and probably to focus on disclosure and making sure that disclosure of how they're managing sustainability risks and that sort of thing. That's that's the way to go. Being very prescriptive and just preventing GPs using Jersey from investing in particular places or in particular strategies could actually be very counterproductive. There's a lot of developing countries, for example, who rely on their trading in natural natural resources. And it doesn't feel to me very sort of ESG compliant to actually put those developing nations uh, into difficulty. So I think what we'll see um, over the next few months is the sort of emergence of, I think, some very sensible rules and regulations in Jersey around this, which also avoid greenwashing, you know, the ability just to sort of kite mark something and say, well, look, now you are ESG compliant, so you're fine. It's, it's got to be more thoughtful. I think than that. I think Jersey, it's always when, when it first developed real estate structures, it built the ecosystem. It had the right directors who were sector specialists. It added some of the regulatory products. I think that's what we're going to see on ESG in the island. Okay, so moving through to uh, the B word or Brexit uh, FMD, if we can still talk about that. I guess, Ben, I want to ask you, um, the, you know, the EU is looking increasingly like a fortress with the UK on the outside. What does that actually mean for Jersey? Where do we stand on, on this emerging? Well, uh, I, I think what we're all hoping and expecting is effectively business as usual. You know, Jersey has been trading a third country um, with the EU since AFMD first emerged uh, you know, a number of years ago now uh, through uh, you know, accessing through the national private placement regimes. I mean, as Jed's described, you know, 30% of your latest funds, investors, a huge fund, were sourced through Europe using those models, so they clearly work. Um, I think the EU has now to decide it's got this huge new third country that it's going to be dealing with, the UK, and you know, some incredible world-leading um, GPs, managers, um, asset managers wanting access to the European market. Is Europe really going to you know, put their, uh, you know, their, their pension funds, their institutional investors as, as a, at a significant advantage by making access to global managers? Uh, you know some of the some of the household name you know global mega funds that we have here in Jersey, for example, let alone those in the UK. Are they really going to put those at a disadvantage by, um, in in some way, sort of rolling back on NPPR access when FMD2 emerges? It, it will start to emerge next year, and obviously there's a uh, European Commission consultation that has gone out, and I'd encourage people, particularly investors, actually, global investors, to respond to that consultation because there was a bit of a sense when FMD1 turned up that investors didn't necessarily necessarily come to the lobbying party early enough. And I think global investors need to recognize that it's in the best interest of the global asset management industry that whichever direction AFMD2 goes in, that it sustains access for third countries.
country managers. Certainly the KPMG survey and report that uh, Europe commissioned, um, the responses from industry that came through that were very clear that you know, access for third country managers um, should be uh, sustained if not enhanced. It would be brilliant for there to be a third country uh, passport. Um, that may be politically a little bit too difficult um, given um, the proximity of, of, of Brexit to this decision. Um, but we would hope that a sustaining of NPPRs very much business as usual from a Jersey perspective in terms of accessing the EU market. It's very much a stability play, Ben, and I think the yes. tried and tested message is what you think, but what about in practice? Jed, was it factor stability in the recent fundraise? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, ahead of fundraising, you do a lot to, to check in with your LPs, you check in with your advisors, you, you make sure that, you know, where you're offering your fund um, is what investors want. You want to make it easy for their investment committee when they come to approve the investment in Nordic Capital, you know, that, that this is a, a well-trodden path, etc. So absolutely, for that reason, Jersey, you know, ticks the box um, and you, you just move on. And, and um, what I would say is that for some of our um, European investors, we did actually offer a, a Luxembourg parallel uh, in order to just keep up optionality to the same point, you check in, you see what investors want, what makes it easy for them. And I think, you know, working on a parallel structure uh, has been has been you know great as well. Great, Michelle, you're a multi-jurisdiction global administrator, um, enjoying great success. What what's been the impact on Brexit on your clients' business? You know, what are you saying and and what conversations are you having with clients around Brexit? Any changes or is stability? I mean. You know, as I said, Jersey remains our largest office, but as I said, we are, um, we're a multi-jurisdictional business and we pride ourselves that. So, you know, and our clients are becoming increasingly multi-jurisdictional, as, as sort of, as, as Jed mentioned. Um, so it always comes back to those discussions, what works best for our clients and, of course, their investors. But, you know, um, specifically on Brexit, you know, obviously Ben's touched on the private placement, placement um, you know, that the regulator's been working with the UK to maintain access. Um, so that's obviously good news. So. Um, you know, I suppose there's still that uncertainty, though. So uh, it's still the old classic: we don't, we don't know. So we, you know, we have to sort of remain, remain vigilant. Um, and I guess it's we don't know what impact there will potentially be to fund structuring. But I know that Jersey will take any steps and measures to, you know, maintain its competitiveness. Um, you know, and we do enjoy a very symbiotic relationship between the regulator, government, and industry to, to be able to move pretty quickly on that. Um, you know, so as a business, yeah, we you say we we remain confident that we continue to offer clients a Jersey solution, but uh, we're also well placed to look at other on source on onshore uh, offices if if that's the solution that works best for them. So, I suppose I would touch on that Jersey has quite a light touch regulatory framework in which to manage non-Jersey entities um, locally. Um, so, you know, we already see this a lot for for our clients and. Um, you know, th you know, they want to take advantage of the local expertise and the um, the service levels that we're sort of well known for. But I know we'll perhaps come up to that a little bit later on in the panel. Okay, and maybe use the EU as a segue into regulation as they uh, they enjoy it the most. Um, I think COVID nineteen has proved to be a mother, the mother of invention for our industry and a chance for us to accelerate regulate reg tech. So I guess want to explore which areas of innovation that Jersey's ushered in. Michelle, how did Jersey react uh, to the reg regulatory challenges when COVID hit? I mean, first of all, I think Jersey deserves enormous credit, really, for, for its reaction to the pandemic. And you know, we saw with the regulator and the control of taxes respond really quickly. Um, you know, firstly, the regulator, you know, as, a, as, we, as we know, we, we enjoy a really strong relationship with them. And, um, you know, some of the areas we saw them, um, you know, respond on was firstly around working with industry, moving from on-site examination to virtual. They were, uh, they relaxed. Um, deadlines for filings, for submissions, to allow for sort of business challenges. You know, really helpfully as well, they stepped up their communication. Uh, they run a series of webinars um, and uh, they provided more guidance on the, the flexible methods of complying with CDD requirements. And, you know, obviously we we're talking about here the virtual world that we've had to operate in and, and, and you know, and the, the various remote fundraisings that we've seen. And, you know, so the timing of that was, was, was really, really helpful. Um, you know, then the controller very early on they relaxed and um, he relaxed the substance rules um, and obviously this was really helpful and sent a really positive message on how quickly the island can can adapt to you know such unprecedented times you know, if i go back to the implementation of the substance rules in early 2019 for me i don't think a huge amount of change was needed i think um, 
you know the boards and the governance of the uh, of entities was was pretty well well run and so really it was about codifying good practice for me and and I think that's because you know Jersey finance industry is really well established and you know we have a you know a strong diverse pool of directors whether that's within service providers or the you know independent nets um, you know and so as I say boards were typically well structured and um, so yeah really positive moves um, from from the regulator and the controller but um, it's a uh, yeah and I think what we're also seeing is a lot of innovation I think it was it was touched on earlier in comments that um, you know, the, the regulator regularly reach, reaches out to, to industry to gather feedback and to, for us to share our experiences to help shape the regulatory framework. Um, you know, obviously we want to keep delivering competitive market solutions, but also being able to respond to changes in the wider landscape and, you know, and requirements coming from the international bodies such as the OECD. Thank you, Michelle. And Peter, you also fulfil roles in other jurisdictions. Do you see a difference in the shop front of Jersey versus those jurisdictions? Um, Michelle mentioned the portals. How, how does our tech stand up? Yeah, um, I'm on some Cayman boards as well, so I've seen um, how Cayman has uh, maybe been a bit slower than um, Jersey in terms of um, reacting to some um, of the regulations that have been pushed on them uh, on offshore jurisdictions by particularly Europe, um, but also the rest of the world um, and some of the international bodies. Um, so there's been a huge amount of change in a short period of time uh, in, in the Cayman, whereas I think um, Jersey's perhaps uh, been working on this for longer and been committed to do it. And there have been some problems um, with online portals, CRS reporting has been delayed numerous times there, um, which isn't the case here. Um, and I, I think generally though, um, smaller jurisdictions that are less committed to the highest regulatory standards will struggle um, and it's becoming whereas in the past if you had a working legal framework in your jurisdiction you would be able to attract business and, and manage it now you have to be able to demonstrate that what is implemented is working um, and that's a huge step up in terms of um, jurisdictions uh, being having to collect data to prove that what is there is working and compliant um, and then address real-time issues and um, undertake enforcement action. So I think uh, smaller jurisdictions are just not really um, geared up or haven't been working with this mindset for, for very long and may, may struggle. I think Jersey is really well placed um, because it, Jersey's always had that open approach and the approach to be you know, leaders or uh, first, first movers in terms of regulatory compliance and being good neighbours to um, to the countries they're close to. Okay, Michelle, Ben discussed the immediate impact and success of the Jersey Private Fund. Is it still popular? Are we seeing rival products in other jurisdictions? How do you see that? I mean, for me, it's been an incredible success story. I know Ben covered off the stats um, in his talk earlier, but you know, I think it really underscores how innovative we are as a jurisdiction. You know, it's a genuinely pragmatic approach. It's geared towards accommodating, accommodating all types of managers and sophisticated investors. Um, so, you know, the trajectory since 2017 is, is, is pretty impressive. You know, in terms of rival products, you know, I think we have to be to be realistic. Um, there's a lot of jurisdictions out there looking to attract fund managers. Um, nobody wants to be left behind. Um, so, you know, if a product works effectively, you're probably going to see it mirrored. Um, in some capacity in those other jurisdictions. You know, Guernsey obviously have it, has its private investment fund, Luxembourg its RAFE, and obviously Ireland is, is bringing its own limited partnership product to the market as well. So, you know, ultimately, um, you know, the very, just, just very best jurisdictions will continue to involve, and um, Jersey has a proven track record in doing that. So, and, and we've no time, we've got no plans to stop anytime soon. And turning to Ben, I guess, Jersey Private Funds cemented part of our foundations now. What new products and regulatory developments are going to be on the menu in 2021? I, th I think probably the most exciting new product will be the LLD, um, you know, which is something which probably is, has been best known in the sort of US environment, whether Delaware or Cayman LLCs used um, around funds, particularly around sort of general partner and carry type structures. Um, which I described as the sort of toolbox of um, structures that we have. Brilliant to have those in Jersey. I mean, lots of the features of companies, but also a little bit more flexibility in terms of how you can write your distribution mechanics and what have you. Um, so I think that will be very welcome. We're already seeing more US flavored business, I think, 
um, whether it's got a sort of European uh, investment bias or not. So you know, hopefully that will increase the familiarity of, of Jersey with um, the, the US market. Um, there's a certain amount of sort of reactive stuff that um, you know, Jersey always has to do. So I described AFMD2, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Hopefully there'll be minimal, if any, impact. Um, there are some delegation changes within AFMD2, which may create a little bit of um, uncertainty for EU-based uh, managers and their ability to be able to delegate out, for example, to UK um, managers and advisors. So that might cause a little bit of disruption within the EU, but um, wouldn't impact on us here in Jersey. Um, I mentioned the OECD initiatives that Jersey is actively engaged in. Um, so the Pillar 1, Pillar 2 um, elements which have come out of the BEPS project. Um, there's a working group here in Jersey that's been looking at uh, the Pillar 2 developments in particular and you know, pleased to say there is a, what looks to me to be a very sort of workable uh, carve out for fund vehicles from the, the application of sort of minimum tax rates within Pillar 2, which is exactly what we'd expect. It's a tax neutral environment. So we keep, we'll keep an eye on that. It's you know, complicated stuff and needs to be, um, needs to be reviewed very carefully. Um, and I think what one thing actually, what positive thing is that we've seen our regulator through changes to, um, you know, uh, there's, there'll be a new registry law coming along, more of a switch to sort of online uh, filing uh, processing of information, which hopefully will speed things up generally in terms of the interaction uh, between industry and the regulator, you know, formation of, of companies, trusts, partnerships, um, uh, filing of information, making notifications, that sort of thing. So, you know, that, that I think is heading in a positive direction. Okay. And moving through to substance, Michelle, a lot's been made of the virtual collaboration between clients and their service providers over the pandemic. What do you think the lasting impact is on substance and the related servicing of structures from Jersey? I suppose the, the short answer is we, we don't know, but I guess we need a bit more detail than that. Um, if I refer back to, you know, talk about substance itself, you know, as I touched on earlier from a Jersey perspective, we felt it was very much about codifying good practice. and. Um, so if clients ultimately determine they want to travel less, for example, then this should not pose too many issues insofar as the, um, you know, the board meetings themselves, if providing the substance test can be met. Um, you know, and technology has played such a, a big part in the success of, you know, of dealing with the pandemic. And I think we all recognize that um, the ease of Teams and Zoom for meetings, the face-to-face -face meetings are, are, are not always required. Um, I, I suppose where I do pause is around that um, there's other interactions with, the, with your clients and those face-to-face -face meetings and, and, and the benefits of those and obviously providing you are you know meeting the, the substance test for your board meetings then I think you know the, the virtual world does not um, match that those face-to-face -face interactions that you have you know before and after a after a board meeting and and also the sort of the social interactions and you know I've been speaking to a number of our clients during the pan during the pandemic and we don't see that changing anytime soon so you know, whilst we may see less travel, we think that, you know, that, that obviously travel is going to continue and, and um, you know, I wouldn't want that to change anytime soon, you know. And Peter, as an INED, is that what you're seeing? Uh, yes, it is. Um, I think what Jersey has done in keeping its board open um, with its test and trace and managing um, COVID and its investment in a regional airline to keep um, links open with, um, with the UK in particular has, is really good. and. Um, Although there may be less travel going forward because people have become accustomed to video, it's still going to be an essential part of maintaining a healthy industry. Um, and I think jurisdictions that have had a closed border policy may struggle to sort of come back. Uh, well, for a start, I think they, there isn't really a clear exit from a closed border policy because COVID is going to be around for some time to come. So. Um, finding a way to open the borders for those jurisdictions is going to be hard. And then once borders are open, um, the long-term damage of having closed borders is a little bit unquantifiable, but it will be hard to bounce back from. So I'm really happy with what Jersey has done um, in maintaining links, maintaining the ability to travel to and from the island, uh, and managing COVID in an effective way. Yeah, and I think you know th there's demonstrable evidence of the government as well for example trying to get an airline to relocate to jersey to maintain those links i think they've put their money where the mouth is and i yeah. think um we're, we're grateful for that i think michelle substance is likened i think for me a lot to specialism and we've got a lot of specialism in the island you touched on emerging managers you know does that matter how are we helping in that regard oh absolutely i mean from a from aztec's perspective specialism is, specialism is a very core of our offering and 
you, you know we focus on alternatives and, and that's it and you know if we if we look at how we structure our teams you know we have a client centric approach so we will structure teams around those first time managers they need a, a slightly different nuanced approach to 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 you know to supporting them and um, you know often they have a limited back office setup so again being able to um, you know walk them through you know and share our experiences of, of um, of closing a fund then you know we found that sort of be really sort of really beneficial um, you know but again you you also need that specialism on um, you know whether it be VC and tech and obviously we structure teams around those and similarly we build a dedicated team to your your larger mid-cap clients your large institutions you know I think all clients need a nuanced approach really it's it's really a you know um, different strokes for different folks as they say and service providers there. So, Jed, you know, during the COVID panic, you know, how, how did the Jersey supply chain uh, stand up? You know, I think you use lawyers, admins, depots, FX providers. You've used everybody. How, sure. did, how did the supply chain stack up? Sure. I mean, uh, I mentioned before that we obviously went into this uh, fundraise launch in early April. We went into lockdown probably mid-March or so. So, you know, we were we were up against the immo an immovable deadline, and we all had to kind of contribute in a remote setting uh, to launching the PPM and just getting that done. And hats off to the NEDs and, you know, Aztec and it, it, the teams basically who we, you know, we're a, a long-term business, we build long-term relationships and, and it's really times like this that you kind of draw on those relationships and, and, and make it happen. And everyone knew and rose to the challenge and, and delivered, so, yeah. Michelle, just picking up on something else you said there, you know, as a global practice, your practice in Jersey, are you just servicing Jersey structures here or is it broader than that? No, no. Um, you know, I think, I mean, Jersey's earned a reputation, I think, because of its global mindset. And I think we recognise that we have to coexist with other jurisdictions. And, um, you know, and I touched on earlier that, you know, we do have a light touch framework with which to um, redomicile entities into Jersey. And, you know, if you look to the, the, the latest Monterey report for Jersey, I think it's around 40% of total P, P in VC NAV is, is um, it, it, our entities domiciled elsewhere. And that's a real mixed bag too, you know, ranging from your, you know, your onshore jurisdictions, UK, Sweden, Denmark, but also your, you know, your offshore jurisdictions too, you know, your Caymans, Bermuda, BVI. Um, you know, I think the reality is fund managers have investments, investors in multiple countries. So, it's that kind of scenario that often necessitates, you know, multi-jurisdictional fund structure. And, you know, so, uh, you know, they're looking for a model that's, you know, the most efficient and effective way possible. So, um, you know, having that sort of ability to, to manage it all from Jersey, I think sort of it, it works, works well. Um, don't get me wrong, Jersey isn't alone in being able to administer structures that are domiciled elsewhere. But I think I'd imagine from those stats that we're probably administering a larger proportion of, of funds not domiciled in Jersey to, to, to other other locations and I think that's a lot to do with um, you know Jersey's reputation as best, best in class from you know uh, in respect of administration you know obviously there's other reasons tax political um, reasons to, to domicile in other jurisdictions but Jersey's selection as the administration hub is often as much to do with service quality other than anything else. Okay and um, Ben short answer hopefully but what advice would you give to a manager that's read the headlines and they think that the only way to structure a PE fund is through Onshore UK? Um, well, Onshore UK, um, I mean, as Mills described, I mean, we, we act for an awful lot of structures where there might be an Onshore UK fund, but there might be general partner carry vehicles in Jersey. So I see the, the relationship between Onshore UK and the Channel Islands as being a largely sort of symbiotic one. I think uh, you see an awful lot of structures with crossover there. I mean, the UK itself, if we are looking at sort of um, you know UK fund products, there's a bit of change there at the moment. There are uh, you know new government initiatives, probably linked to Brexit, to um, you know, looking at domestic fund products in the UK. Frankly, to see how they might be enhanced, um, that's actually quite a difficult thing to achieve because there's a fair amount of complexity uh, in the UK tax landscape. Um, I describe that sort of simplicity. Um, that Jersey hangs its tax neutrality on. Achieving that in any kind of onshore setting is very difficult when you look at income tax, corporation tax, capital gains tax, VAT, etc. So, you know, they, they'll, they'll have some challenges getting through that. And I, I very much see, you know, as I said, Jersey's role as being a sort of symbiotic um, sort of offshore adjunct to the City of London, very much in the same way that Cayman has operated alongside the US market and the Asia market for many years. 
Um, you know, I think that is very much Jersey's role is to be uh, that sort of symbiotic offshore, um, efficient, cost effective structuring solution for UK managers. Um, and I think that will continue irrespective of what might happen around sort of domestic UK products. I think there will think probably be a lot of them that are still managed here and administered here. Great. Thank you, Ben. And last question for me, uh, just five word answers. We've had a few come through. Um, start with Jed. What's the biggest strength of Jersey that you think is underestimated? Um, I'd probably say something, I think you touched on it, Michelle, but you know, the regulator is actually pro-business. So um, I, think, I think that is probably underestimated, how much the regulator is, you know, is working with business, communicating to business and making things more business friendly. Okay, Peter? Yeah, I'd say political stability, regulatory stability. Um, in, um, in the rest of the world, it seems like centrist policy uh, is, is no longer in favour and there's a divergence um, to the extremes and that creates political risk. I don't think you find that in Jersey. I think there's political stability and, and setting up a, a, a fund that might be in existence for more than a decade um, in a jurisdiction where there's significant political risk is, you know, it, it may, I think Jersey offers you that, um, that sort of mitigation, if you like. Great. Michelle? Um, I would say, I'll, obviously I, I agree with these points, but the, our Anglo-Saxon work, working culture, instantly a number of distinctions, you know, US, UK, Middle East, um, so I think that's definitely underestimated. Service from a service provider, I love that. Yeah. Ben? I, I, well, uh, as a reflection of that, really, I think people, just the quality yeah. of the people here. Um, it, it, I talked about the sort of non-human um, infrastructure that we have here and, and pedigree and what have you, but the fact of the matter is there are very few international finance centres that have been servicing PE and venture capital in the way that we have over the last 30 to 40 years, you know, and you've got people, including myself, who started in this game in 1997 in Jersey, who've just been doing this for years and seeing it evolve and seeing it develop, absorbing that change, you know, looking forward to seeing how we can enhance and improve the service provision, uh, you know, seeing how GPs and investor requirements develop. Um, and, you know, my uh, great panelists here, I think they, they, you know, we love working with them. Um, you know, it's, it's never difficult, I think, getting funds launched and run in this jurisdiction. Um, we see as a, you know, what is now a sort of global offshore firm. And we do hear stories about some onshore jurisdictions where, frankly, the service levels, you know, are frustrating for some clients. Um, so, you know, very proud of the people that um, I work alongside here in Jersey. Great, thank you, Ben. Well, I'm afraid the time, uh, the time is up. So I think first thing to do is thank the audience for bearing with us with the technical difficulties at the start. Thank you for that. This session will be available uh, online immediately. Um, so thank you to Jersey Finance for that, who will host it. Um, thank you mainly as well to my panel for their time to participate today and also to prepare. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>